This conference will now be recorded. Okay, everybody. Hi there. Welcome to the Kubernetes Corner Show. And today we have a fantastic guest. I'm really excited about this. Moonshot Manambeth from CodeCloud. Now, I know a lot of you have probably heard about CodeCloud, or you should have if you're learning Kubernetes. Uh, so I'll give you just a background of, of how I found CodeCloud, because I think it's interesting. I got interested in Kubernetes, and then I started hearing about these certifications, and, and everyone was telling me terrifying stories of how hard they are, so and how expensive the certification was. So I thought, I'm not going to risk this. I'm going to go and look for a good course. And I walked around, I went around and, and searched around, but the one that I found, which honestly, and this is not an advertisement, I haven't been paid or anything like that, was CodeCloud. That, honestly, these courses help me pass certifications uh, because they are challenging certifications, they're command line, and they're open book, but that doesn't help you uh, because if you don't know it. So you need to have a special course, uh, which is designed for the exams. Uh, on top of that, they have a lot of other courses, which Moonshot will tell us about, but for me and my learning experience, it just it was top grade. So I am really happy that Moonshot's here. And um, I first found out about Moonshot after I saw a blog about San Diego KubeCon, which he'd attended. And that was also the first time I found out about Kasten. So it's it's funny how the planets all align, right? Um, so I first of all want to introduce Moonshot and ask him about his IT background and perhaps how he got into DevOps and how he started CodeCloud. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks, Jeff. For first of all, thanks so much for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so yeah, I've been uh, working in the IT industry for about I think like 15 years now. Um, started off my career uh, uh, back in India in, in Bangalore, so I did my studies in Bangalore. Um, I got a job as a uh, uh, technical support engineer for a, a storage uh, storage array. So we were supporting storage arrays, and um, I then moved on to operations role. Um, I did some uh, operations work around you know provisioning, and, and that's when I got introduced to Linux and, and servers for the first time. So uh, got introduced to uh, provisioning storage arrays, doing migrations. Um, and that's when I realized that there was a lot of uh, opportunity to uh, improve the processes. And you know, uh, so I did a lot of uh, some of the scripting and, and automation work back then. Um, so I kind of um, kind of got my hands on like anything. Um, so I was very interested in development um, uh, back at college. Um, and um, so I, I kind of got my hands on to scripting or any kind of automation that came my way. Um, so I, I spent a couple of years doing that. And then I moved into, I was more interested in the software side of things. Um, so I slowly moved into um, monitoring softwares. Um, and that's where I worked a little bit, you know, uh, deploying and installing and configuring uh, these softwares. Um, and, and that's when I got in, uh, involved in virtualization. So I did uh, a bunch of VMware related stuff uh, um, and uh, also got into you know, developing some software, so developing drivers for storage arrays and things like that. Um, and then there was this opportunity to work on a hybrid cloud uh, automation deployment. So it was a VMware based uh, hybrid cloud environment stack. Um, that had all the kind of the VM, VMware components, you know, the, the vRealize automation, orchestrator, and things like that. Um, and back then, it uh, took like months to um, really go to a customer and deploy this this entire stack of you know, tens of different VMs, and then uh, making them and installing software on them and connecting them together. Um, again, that's that's when I got into kind of automation again and um, that's when I first uh, got introduced to Ansible. Um, and uh, I initially wrote a lot of scripts in uh, shell scripts and Python and trying out automating this. And then I came across, some, someone told me about Ansible and how easy it was to use it. And I just looked at it and realized that it was a perfect uh, tool. Um, and there were already like plugins and modules available to work with VMware. So, um, so, I, uh, so I worked on that, I think that was, Probably one of the first time that I, that I got into working with one of these tools, um, and then I moved into from there on. I moved into like full uh, kind of full-time development, you know, full-stack development, so backend um, 
um, development in Python and and front end development as well. Um, and and it was uh, then that I realized. Uh, so we had to you know build a team together to um, put together the solution, and it was really getting hard to uh, get other developers in and get them to uh, first of all build uh, a similar development environment as as I had, and uh, with a lot of we had a lot of dependencies and you know other VMware related packages and stuff that had to be uh, had to be installed, and then uh, the other developers were using their own. You know, system somewhere using Windows, others were Linux and different versions of Linux. So it was hard to put together a process to get get them all to uh, you know, put just set up a development environment. And initially, I um, came up with a solution of um, you know packaging a, a VM with with everything that 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 was needed in it, um, and that worked. So everybody had to just you know provision and just just copy this image. And, and uh, provision it, and then you know, they just had everything that they needed to to start developing. But then it got to a state where you know, every time something had to change, mm. you know, they had to I had to then repackage it and then share it, and they had to destroy their VM and re, rebuild. It, it kind of got really really hard. And so uh, so and that's where I, I I looked around and found Docker. Um, so and then as soon as I saw Docker, it was like I was very excited. And because that solved the exact problems that we were having, right? So now, it doesn't matter what um, version of Linux the other developers were using. Once I built a Docker image, then I had them use that, and it just worked all the time. So we we used Docker initially just to work, uh, just to improve our uh, kind of the the work that we were doing in the uh, by building the development environments. But then we realized we could use the same to also ship the application. Um, to, to the end user, just as a Docker image, right? So that was uh, uh, that was pretty cool. So I was really excited about uh, learning about Docker. Just you know, really wanted to share it. So I shared it with the people um, internally in the company, um, and then they were very really excited. And then I started sharing it outside, and and that's when you know I started coming up with the courses and and the videos and uh, and other things. So yeah, I mean that, that that's kind of you know where I started and and um, how I got into into DevOps. That's really interesting because I see I didn't realize that you had actually been a VMware person. So you're perfect for this because you actually are similar to a lot of people who are right now you know doing VMware and I mean making the movement. But what I really like about your story is that you actually went through what everyone was telling you before I knew anything about containers is the developers love it because they don't have to have like, you know, 15 different VMs with a different version of dependencies for Python, yeah. or whatever. And so you actually yeah. went through that when that was happening. So, so another thing too is, which is interesting too, which you mentioned is the, the desire to have things made easier. So even really smart developers, and I always think developers are really smart because I don't do any coding, but people want things to be easier, right? And so you were yeah. doing things in Python, it was working, but yeah. when you saw Ansible, Right, because you have yeah. he also you also have uh, Ansible courses by the way, um, yeah, on your site. So that's that's really interesting. So one thing I'm interested in as well is what were the biggest challenges moving to education? Because before that you were pure techie in the sense you yeah. know developer, and now you're having to teach. And let's face it, they're different skills, aren't they? Yep. Yes. Yes. So um, I, I mean, I've always been a kind of a teacher myself from. Um, from my college days, so I used to like you know conduct internal trainings, and you know I really liked helping others. And um, what I, uh, I mean, that's how I kind of first learned uh, programming, um, because it, at first I didn't really get uh, you know the whole programming, uh, I mean coding, because um, a, a lot of us, I mean people were just, I just saw that, and everybody, including me, were just kind of. Uh, memorizing the lines of code and, and trying to get it work. And the first time that it clicked uh, to me was when I uh, saw uh, the guy next to me struggle with a, a, a simple code. And then I just knew that, I, I mean, just trying to help him, I realized that it was uh, a, a simple like semicolon missing in a, in, a, in a place. And then, but when I solved that, I realized that I, I kind of got it, right? So from there on, I just, you know, kept, I just tried to, Keep helping people, and then and then I realized I just learned a lot just by looking at uh, the mistakes that others made and just tr uh, troubleshooting their code and helping them uh, uh, fix things. 
So, and then I just continued to do that for the throughout the rest of my career. So, uh, I mean, while I was working with VMware, I would like randomly uh, pick a bunch of like new joinees and then, you know, uh, take them to a training uh, and then tease them about, about stuff. And then they would ask like real simple questions that I wouldn't have answered to. So I'd go back, I'd have to go back and learn and understand. And then that's when I would be like super clear on, uh, uh, on, on those on those uh, technologies so so I kept doing that um, all along and then um, I think it was when I uh, learned about ansible and, and docker um, around that time I was also trying to you know um, uh, build something I mean I was really interested in trainings and I, I, and there were these training platforms that were coming up and and that's how I learned like web development and coding, you know, just uh, through these these platforms, training platforms that are out there. And they, they were pretty dope, uh, pretty cool platforms uh, where you could like learn by doing. And I was really inspired. Um, so I tried to, you know, create a few videos and stuff. And that that's when I created. I think the first course was on Ansible, and um, one of the platform uh, back uh, at that time was Udemy. Um, so I posted the course on Udemy. And you know, fortunately, people liked um, the way I explained things, and um, uh, and there were no not many courses on Ansible at that time, so um, I was lucky. So yeah, and then I just, from there on, I just kept uh, listening to my students. You know, the, they asked me for an advanced course, so I started creating that, and then I just they just asked me for a course on Docker and. I know luckily I was working on Docker at the time, so I created that uh, and then Kubernetes and then CK, the certification courses. So I just kept listening to what uh, everybody asked and I just you know, kept on creating courses. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's how I started uh, getting into creating uh, content. I think the first couple of years I was working uh, at my company and then you know, creating courses uh, in my own time in the evenings and weekends, but then uh, after I had about like five or eight courses and you know a lot of students, it got to a point where I, I just thought I could like quit and just do that full time because I just really liked and just enjoyed uh, doing that. Um, so yeah, um, I mean that's that's how kind of my journey started with, with the whole education. Did, did you ever think it would become a full time job when you started? You know, showing I didn't. The <laughs> yeah, no, no, I didn't. Like I didn't. Think that it would become a full-time job even like a month before i actually quit uh, because it was <laughs> never, yeah it was never a full-time job for me i mean i was just i, mean, I always like i liked my job i liked uh working uh and um i you know you you get to work on like real uh projects and stuff so i just uh, wanted to continue to do that um but then it just got to a point where like it, it just both just got so overwhelming and I just decided like, I mean, I just thought like, why not just quit? And so I think like the same day I put my papers and in, in after a month, I left the company. Wow. Yeah, well, and that's one thing I'll point out with Code Cloud, which I really like is the feedback mechanism because there's a part on the site where you say, what courses would you like? And people, you know, type things in and yeah. lo and behold, they actually show up. And that's always yeah. nice. I actually was one of the people who went, I want an open shift course and I want a PCA yeah. course and boom, they yeah. came out. That's yeah. that's really good because the feedback's important. I think it's also important that one of the things that happened, you naturally fell into a niche, which obviously was not being full, was not being fed, put it that way. Um, there was a big desire for training out there for this type of training. And, you know, it just wasn't there. Um, so, you know, you came at the right time. But tell me one thing, as far as, uh keeping up with technology this is a question i get asked all the time um they say jeff um you must have no social life right because i do a study and i go well yeah i mean but in seriousness though it is a big problem for professional it people and even i think for people who are young who are just out of college they're doing their college courses to keep up with the fast pace what would your yeah. recommendations be to to everybody on, on that account yeah um so yeah so that's Totally true, um, especially I think in this age, I think in the past uh, five years or the past decade, where things uh, started changing really quickly because I think um, 
uh, with a lot of communities, uh, people coming together, forming communities, and the open source communities where you know everybody's sharing everything. Um, I think those led to um, the the you know development of a lot of these new ways uh, of you know building infrastructure and maintaining and configuring and uh, even application development. Um, so we've seen like a big uh, uptick in you know the number of tools or the the innovation that's happening in this whole industry. So uh, I, and I also understand that it's like super overwhelming uh, when it comes to uh, seeing all these tools and then having to learn all these tools. Um, and there's like um, so many different variations of tools for just solving the same problem and everybody coming up with their own tools. So um, like the CNCF landscape, if you see, there's like yeah. a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things in there. Yeah. So, and that's the thing is that uh, the first time uh, when I was at KubeCon in LA, they had on the wall, the landscape on this big, chart <laughs> and yeah. i looked at it and went, oh boy i don't have to learn yeah. all this do i but yeah. the other problem too is what people i've heard saying and and i kind of ran into this too because i got into kubernetes through docker swarm and it was a funny story yeah. my company we were using veeam and veeam introduced um s3 as a capacity tier and we went and looked around and we found minio and they said well you really to do this multi-tenant you need to do it with containers oh, okay and they said, you know, Kubernetes or Docker. And I very naively thought, well, I'll take a book on the weekend, learn Kubernetes and have it on Monday working. Well, <laughs> uh, that was not what happened to say the least. I found Docker Swarm to be a bit easier, especially the networking, the overlay. And so I got yeah. it working, but I was bitten by the bug because, you know, I was annoyed that, you know, this was so, so difficult. But somebody yeah. asked me back then a question. Well, Jeff, how do you know you're betting on a winner? So you've got all these Kubernetes or all these different things out there, you know, Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, all these different tools. You're going to invest your time, which is limited, into one of them. What if you invest your time to something that in five years is no longer here? That, so that's a question people have, how, how to be certain. And I, I mean, the only answer I had was I was looking at the open source landscape and the people talking and seeing the majority of voices, basically. Uh, but what would your recommendation be to people who say, look, as you said, there's so much out there. What do I choose? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, so two things, right? So one to continue uh, the previous answer and just to finish that off. Right. So like how, to, uh, how do, when, when it comes to education and learning and, you know, uh, there, there's so much out there and, and what to learn. Um, so if, so first of all, if it's uh, in, in your current like your work, your requirements. Um, so what is it that your company needs, your, um, you know, your project needs uh, out of you? And and you said the Docker Swarm versus Kubernetes, right? But if it is Docker Swarm, right? And it could be Docker Swarm too, right? If uh, there, there could be use cases, scenarios where you could just get away with Docker Swarm, you know, a super simple setup, easy, easy to, and I personally, when I started uh, into container orchestration, when we build the, our labs that that run on container orchestra um, clusters we started with docker swarm it was just super easy to, as, as you said super easy to get started and 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 that worked for years right so there's um and you also want to spend make sure you spend your time on um efficiently and on things that really matter so when it comes to choosing tools or technologies to solve problems um i think it's always important to see um first first evaluate what are the tools that you need uh, to, to write tools for your, for your problems um, and I mean of course Kubernetes is not the solution to all the problems right and you don't have to make it that way too um, there could be uh, a lot of other solutions um, so yeah I mean so when it comes to you know the product development or like when we build the first version of our it's our school or our online learning platform, which just went with like a SaaS platform that that gave us uh, where you could just go in and build uh, your own school, online school in like one day, right? So oh, nothing, oh, you don't need cool. to worry about anything. And then there's, there are so many similar platforms out there, like the no code platforms or the, the software as a service platforms where you, you don't really need to know anything to to build those applications, and I, I think that that kind of that trend in that area is going to um, 
uh, going to increase. Um, but yeah, I think it's all about um, one, uh, if, you, if you're uh, trying to identify a solution for your, your, your company, for your organization, should always be based on uh, what problems that, is it that you need to solve and identifying the right tool uh, so you can manage it efficiently as well with the resources you have in hand. Um, if, it, if, it's, if it comes to learning, so if it, if it does, doesn't really have anything to do with, um, like if you're looking for a job change or if you, you know, want to really upscale and get to the next level, uh, then I think it, it matters uh, that you look at um, um, the, of course, the most uh, in demand or the most, uh, um, if you look at job descriptions out there and, and do your analysis on what are the you know, tools, uh, what are the opportunities available, then you might want to make a decision based on that as well. So I think I would answer that in, in those two ways. Yeah, that's that's a yeah. good way to put it. And it actually shows the different generations too, to some extent, because you've got the virtualization people who are thinking, well, what problems do I have now? What problems in the future? And then you've got people coming fresh out of college, for instance, who, you know, Kubernetes. And, and the funny thing is the last Canada Kubernetes meeting I went to, um, there were some young uh, people there and that's all they've done was Kubernetes. And I thought, wow, this is incredible. So you, you don't know what a physical server is? You know, you yeah. never had a tape in your head? Um, so yeah. that's it. So another question I've got for you, because you are kind of the incarnation of both. So people ask me, what is this term DevOps? And I say, I have no idea. But but developers and operations. And there's this whole thing of the different mindsets. And, and the only way I can put it, I've been in rooms where there's been the operations people and the developers. And the developers will sit there quietly looking at the screen for hours. And the operations people are trying to avoid picking up the phone. They're talking to each other. And so, you know, it, there is a, a mindset difference. And it, what, how have you seen that? And, and do you see that differently in the education section as well? Yeah. So, I mean, if you were to ask me uh, about DevOps, um, so first of all, I, I believe that it's like a, it's a very natural evolution of uh, everything that we have all been doing, you know, the, the developers developing software and, and the operations people running it uh, and everyone else involved too. Right. And for years um, we've been, I mean, as this admins, we've been trying to, automate um, and, and, and that, that, I mean, we have been doing that, right? Uh, we've been trying to make things efficient, you know, when there are like hundreds of servers to patch, we've always tried to build scripts um, to, uh, to pass them and to automate some of those uh, processes, as, as I mentioned, like when we were doing migrations, um, there were so many things that, uh, I mean, all you had to do was log into a Linux server and just run commands one after the other uh, and I, I just kept wondering, like, why hasn't anyone written a script for it, right? Uh, with a, uh, a few decisions that had to be made in between, which could you could easily write with, like, if statements in, in a script. Um, so we've always, uh, as SSAdmins, admins, we've always tried to improve things um, efficiently. And as developers, you always wanted uh, your code to go live uh, as soon as possible in, in, in the best way. Um, so I think all that effort that everyone put in in, in for, for those years, so if you look at the sysadmins, I mean, all the sysadmins in the world were, uh, all, all of them were working on the Linux systems, in, be, be, the, be them in, in different banks or different organizations, they were all having the same problems and they were all trying to solve the same problems and probably they were solving it in the same way. They were probably writing like very similar scripts, right? So there's like a lot of duplication of work and, um, that's where, uh, as I said, in the past decade, when uh, people came together, build communities, and uh, when companies opened up to sharing uh, their projects through those projects and stuff, um, that's when all of these efforts came in and became evolved into these like tools, like for infrastructure, you have like you know, Chef, Puppet, and then Ansible and Terraform. These evolved where uh, like you didn't have to solve these problems, uh, you know, you're in your own way. Instead, um, and now it's being shared, like somebody is solving it once and then they're able to share it. The same goes on the developer's um, uh, side of things too, right? The, all the development processes, the builds and tests and everything um, is is uh, is evolved. And 
Um, now, like uh, ultimately, everybody, I mean, to me, DevOps is really going from the idea to getting it out in the easiest and uh, uh, the most efficient way possible. Um, and so everybody, all the manual tasks in between is really um, kind of hindering that, that process. And, and we've anyway been trying to automate these. It just got to a new, new level and, and it's now named uh, DevOps. So, um, and, and of course, all the other kind of uh, methodologies um, that are part of it, like, you know, reducing wastage, um, building lean, uh, going lean first, uh, the lean first approach, and, and then listening to feedback. And I mean, these are um, natural things that you would do anyway. Um, and I think now with, with DevOps, you've kind of defined uh, all of these things. Um, and, and just now it's kind of, anyway, like today, if you're building a new application, you're automatically, even if you, as you said, uh, the, those junior um, engineers or developers that are coming out of school today, they're not going to go and build on servers, you know, uh, and, and deploy applications. They're just going to use, uh, you know, some kind of serverless, probably they'll start with functions and then they'll work their way. If, if, they, if needed, they'll probably work, use some kind of serverless uh, um, uh, tools or technologies to build their applications. They don't even want to know about servers or anything that's happening, right? So so I think that is the natural progression. Um, and, and I mean, if even if you call yourself as a DevOps engineer or not, uh, we're already, I think we're already there. Anything new that's being built today is built you know, with those principles in mind. Yeah, exactly. And one interesting thing I want to talk about as well, so before I forget, is Code Cloud has this thing called Code Cloud Engineer. And what it is, and it's free, uh, you can also sign up for the paid version, but you can sign up for the free version. What it is, you go through the stages and you get these problems that you have to solve. And I remember telling my former company, oh, this is great because you're getting practice. And somebody said to me, Jeff, don't you get enough severity one problems at work and now you're doing it for fun? I mean, but it was wonderful. And I wanted to ask you about the idea and, and, and why it came up. And basically you can go higher in these ranks and you get real yeah. problems. So you get Kubernetes problems, you get Ansible problems. And one of the things I love about it was, for instance, you mentioned Puppet, you mentioned Chef. I wasn't necessarily going to have anything to do with those because I, I, I'm thinking Terraform, Ansible. But this system forces you to play with it a bit because it has questions that come up. And mm -hmm. I started to think, well, this is kind of good. And, and you know, you don't have to become an expert, but you can solely. But so who came up with that idea? And, and it, I think it seems to be really popular, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. So, um, so when we had like, uh, uh, I think about 10 or 15 courses out and all, on all of these technologies and then people go through the course, they finish the course and then they're back and they're asking like, you know, we need more, we need something more, like I need, I need to practice more. Like, do you have any, any projects or, you know, uh, that I can work on? And um, I think we came up with some like projects initially on, on GitHub and, you know, like a set of questions, but then it wasn't interesting enough because people, like we didn't know if they did it right. And then we didn't know if they did it right. And um, there was, I mean, we were not getting enough feedback and um, some students would go through it and they were not really, uh, uh, they wouldn't follow through and there was nothing that could keep them going, right? And it had to be made more interesting. And that's how we came up with this um, concept of a Code Cloud Engineer where we thought, you know, what if we put you into a, a virtual company? You know, there's no salary and, you know, there's no firing or no experience required. So none of that, but at the same time, you, uh, you get like real kind of real world projects. Um, you have you have a manager, so you have this animated character who is like your manager. You're going to get an email every day with the tasks that you need to do, and you're not you're just not doing it on your own. Uh, you're still doing it on our lab. So we had the labs by then. So the and then we had all the validation mechanisms and everything built in. We had all the environments like Kubernetes, Ansible, and all of that. And so we thought we could like kind of go really creative with it to you know, like build a Kubernetes cluster and break something somewhere and then send a, assign a task to one of the uh, code cloud engineers to see if they can solve it, right? And it was easily reproducible. Like we could we could assign that task like thousands of engineers and they can, they all kind of can go through it. 
And so now you're you have a mail, you know, so you're, you're it's Monday and you just get a mail from Cloud Cloud Engineer saying there is a broken Kubernetes cluster. Here's a task. So you're going in, logging in, and when you look at it, there's a cluster already and there's applications running, but there's some, something broken and you have no idea what's uh, what's broken because you didn't break it, right? I mean, we broke it for you. Okay. So and this could be anything, right? So there could be um, I mean, there, this could be a, an issue with the QBAPI server, like a port uh, that's wrong, or the HCD server going down, or it could be anything. And so now you're like troubleshooting in, in, as a real engineer, trying to figure out what the problem is. You're going through all the troubleshooting steps. So, um, so it, it doesn't start off like that. So it always starts off with like very simple stuff, like Linux stuff, like creating a user and onboarding a new user. Um, so uh, and then as you said it builds on to these different levels um and and there's also things like you know when you're when you're working in a uh, in a new company or like let's say a startup where you know you're just uh, expected to to start working and uh, without any kind of formal onboarding right um you have these uh, uh these documents somewhere with the you know the this architecture diagram somewhere this uh information about users and and credentials to access these things in different places so you have to really go through and look at the architecture diagram and figure out okay the backup server is here the um, um, you know the the LDAP the AD server is here um, so you have to figure those things out on your own so we kind of purposely made it kind of vague uh, saying that these are the resources you have and the question is just that um, hey the backup server is broken and then you have to fix it right and there's nobody to help you so there's a, there's a little bit of investigation that you have to do outside of like the server and stuff like before even getting into the server look at the architecture diagram understand like what's the name of the backup server kind of figure out how to what's the ip address of that and then log into the jump server then log into the backup server so um i think i think people really like that uh and we've been uh since um adding uh, more and more tasks to it um so there's this this last phase called the solutions architect where you know so you start off as a junior role like a junior DevOps engineer we call it and then uh, like a senior and the DevOps engineer and senior DevOps engineer and then with the architect level we really wanted to do something different because until then you're just working on these Linux shells and you know just just building custom I mean just working on these troubleshooting issues or, or you know provisioning stuff deploying applications. Uh, almost all, all of the things that we kind of teach in in our courses, but now it's done in a, like a different way. So yeah. if you go through the courses, you uh, you should be able to, and if you really learn something, then you should be able to apply that those here. Um, but then uh, with the, the essay, the last level, we wanted to do something different. And then so right now we have our cloud labs. So we have like um, in the past year we've been working on integrating the cloud playgrounds, which is like the AWS GCP and and Google Cloud, so we have all of that. Um, so right now it's just playgrounds where you know you just get access to one of these for three, uh, like for about three hours, and then you can do whatever you want without having to worry about the bills or costs or anything, sure. as long as you have a, an active subscription, of course. Um, but then, so right now we're working on integrating this to the Cloud Cloud Engineer. So now going forward, uh, some of the SA level roles would be where you have uh, an entire cloud environment with VMs and uh, network, you know, network VPCs and everything configured. So now you're going to have to troubleshoot like an entire uh, fully provisioned cloud environment with a lot of systems and all of that exclusively for, for you. And the issue could be anywhere, right? It could be an IP address, wrong IP address in the configured in the VPC, or it could be an SSL certificate issue or um, uh, a, a wrong subnet or something like that. And then, so that's going to be really challenging. So, so those are coming up. Uh, that's what we're working on right now. Now, but yeah, I mean, uh, uh, people really like it. They kind of add it as an experience to their uh, to their resume. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was really shocking. Uh, um, but yeah. Yeah, because I I will say that what I like about it is I I've worked before for service providers, so backup service providers, and one of the things we have to do is go into people's environments, different companies' environments, and help them out. And so it was always a cold shower, I used to say, because you'd come into certain environments, they'd be nicely, and you come into other environments, it would be a jungle. And, you know, but you as the consultant, whatever, would have to come in. And I thought to myself, uh, it was very stressful, but it also was extremely good for growth. 
for you know practice and i thought well what if you just work in one company all your life and you've got and you after a while if you're good at it you know all your systems pretty well you'll have a disaster once every once in a while so yeah. the thing i like about co-cloud engineers I, my answer to this person was well yes it's severity one problems but it's different environments and there's no stress because i don't get fired right <laughs> so that's one thing to remember so yeah. one, one question is it must be difficult to keep all these things running uh, because I mean, the very complicated environments, I guess your background, especially in coding and in supporting systems has helped, but that probably grew on you too, because the demand yeah. was, is that a big yes, yeah, absolutely. Yep. yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so, uh, I mean, so, so it, d it definitely helped, I mean, uh, put together kind of the proof of concepts in the beginning, um, as I was thinking about building these labs. And in fact, I was, um, um, even before building the labs, uh, myself, um, I mean, I, I really like, I'm a person of uh, lean approach, so I, I always kind of try to see if there are ways uh, uh, that that's, uh, if there are lean ways that's, that's available before I go in and like spend hundreds of hours trying to build something from scratch, right? So, um, so one of the funny thing is that, um, so when I first started the CK AD uh, course, so I didn't, we didn't have any labs for the for many of the initial courses, right? So we had Ansible, Docker, uh, the uh, Kubernetes for Beginners course, we had Chef, Puppet, and none of these courses initially had any labs on it. Uh, so it, it was without the labs for, for a year or so. And then we had the Kubernetes courses, and then, um, and, and my uh, goal was just to, you know, continue to keep creating like basic courses on all of these technologies, right? So, so I had Docker, Ansible, um, then I was, I had Kubernetes and, and then I was, my plan was to just go kind of wide and cover like maybe other tools that are out there, like Git and Terraform. And, uh, and then it, it was around then that, uh, people were said like the Kubernetes beginner course that I created was like, like too basic. Um, that was my, my goal too, but, um, I kind of received some, uh, you know, feedback that it was too basic and they needed more. And that's when that's where I realized that there were certification courses. So you know why not create the courses on certification? So so I, I prepared the CKAD certification first um, because that was because back then CKAD was two hours and the CKA course was three hours uh, yep. long, and and CKAD had like very few portions to cover and CKA had like a lot. So I wanted to tackle the the small one first. So um, so uh, I. I Build a CKD course. Uh, in fact, before building the course, I, I took the exam myself, and I barely passed. I mean, I, I just really? just passed. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to see what the uh, format was because you know um, because I knew that uh, I didn't even know that it was a hands-on exam in the beginning. I thought it was a multiple choice, but then as I kind of enrolled in the exam, I realized that it was a different format. So before building a course, I wanted to see yeah. uh, get an idea, and there were no courses back then really um uh there were a few github repositories that had uh, information about how the exams were going to be but there were no courses so i thought that it was a good opportunity too so um so i took the exam and uh, i remember and I, I did the mistake that everybody does right so when you have you have a few questions easy questions you do that really fast and then you yeah. get this hat hard question and then you get stuck on that and then i just wanted to fix that uh, no matter what right so i spent like a, a 20 a good 20 25 minutes on one question and then i realized that i'm running out of time and then i, I skipped that and go through and try to complete the rest and then i ran out of time uh, and i just rem i remember you know, telling my wife that i mean i just i could have finished it at the last few questions if i had been a bit more uh, mindful with the time um but then and then when the results came i think it was like 66 percent to pass and i had like 67 percent, so i i just <laughs> made it through uh, but i got a good idea of uh how the format is uh you know how to prepare everybody so i uh so once, once the uh once i prepared the uh, the course and and released it i kind of knew that it was you know with the hands-on part was going to be a challenge for a lot of people so i tried to add a lot you know a lot of tips to the course but but unfortunately we i think initially still a lot of people really found it really hard to uh, to crack the exam 
Um, so the initial version went out without any labs, and then that's where I decided to build labs. Um, so uh, while building labs, my like I was sure, like I was sure that there was there was no there were no Kubernetes labs out there for sure. Like I was I was sure I was just going I was just going to have to build it my own. Uh, but I right before I went out to build, I thought I'll, I'll quickly Google and see if there is something already. And then I did that, and I found out the uh, there was Katakoda, which is the you know, uh, which one of you must be familiar with already. Katakoda had like this instant terminal uh, access to the playgrounds. And I was like super surprised. And then when I looked uh, around a little bit more, I realized that they have these options to embed it to your platforms if you wanted. So I wrote to uh, the founder and, and uh, he was pretty open to support what I was doing. And he gave, and we kind of struck a deal on you know how, how many uh, you know the the, the um, uh, kind of the on the business side of things. I mean, it was very generous. So uh, so I started building uh, on that, and so it saved me a lot of time uh, in in building something from scratch. So we used that for like the first I think a year or more or two even. We just built everything on Katakoda, and both our CKA and CKD courses had those labs. And then it was after that. Uh, Calicota got acquired by O'Reilly, and then they had other plans, so we had to build something on our own. So that's when we first put together the original proof of concept. And uh, I realized that, I mean, uh, I, I couldn't do it alone. I needed a team. So that's when, uh, uh, by that time, I had quit. So I, I also hired a couple of other guys, uh, Vijin, who uh, helped me um, kind of he just took on the entire development and uh, side of the whole lab and just help me put it all together so so right now we're about um five people uh in the just the labs team who wow. uh, are you know full-time just focusing on on the labs and then we have like lab development engineers so um, um you know, if you're interested in like you know just creating these scenarios and you know uh just putting together questions uh again uh through our we have a slack community where everybody uh we have about 60,000 people, I'm pretty sure. Wow. You're, you're part of it. Yeah, yeah, no, I've seen that. I, I, the number keeps going up, so it's like, you know. Yeah, yeah. so we, we have about 60,000 people there. So we we, all, we just tried to reach out to you know, anybody who's interested in working with us, and you know, there's a lot of people you could get. And we've put, made that interface where you could like easily build some of these scenarios. Um, so yeah, so a team of five just working on the, uh, you know, uh, keeping these labs up. And then uh, we have many other lab engineer, I mean, development engineers who who build the labs. Yeah, and I'll say it works really well because I I subscribed and I I like to go in the playgrounds too. And it's not just playgrounds GCP. They have like a playground for like Ansible, like specific. You want yeah. a three node cluster, you can go in there. So I do that yeah. a lot. I wanted to turn some questions from other people, and one's from Michael Cade. So I'll quote his question. I would love to get your perspective on the evolution of the system administrator, the operations or infrastructure engineers having to evolve or choosing to evolve and look at automation, DevOps principles and adopting new platforms like Kubernetes. Well, we partially answered that already, but that's his question. Again, a lot of the people watching this are making the step forward and it's a bit overwhelming when you look at the field. So, yep. yeah. What, so, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, the, the evolution of these roles, right? It, and I think like when it comes to any role, it uh, doesn't matter. Um, I mean, like everything needs to evolve. It, that's, and everything evolves eventually. That's that's kind of my belief. Be it a, like a software developer, you're, uh, you've been working on like C or Java in the past, and now you have to learn like I don't know, Python or Golang to, to and you have that there's an evolution there. If you're a front end developer, you know, you've been working on, um, I think JavaScript in the back uh, in the past, and now you have um, Vue.js and Next.js and you know uh, React and all of that. So you have to evolve. The the same goes for uh, I think anything. So um, the sysadmins in the past. So uh, as I said, it's a natural evolution. Um, you know, and, and when there were mainframes, and then we evolved to like servers. So everybody learned servers, and we've been working on that. And then like about a decade ago, you have like uh, or 15 years ago, you have VMware coming up with virtualization, and then we all started learning virtualization. Like there was no living without virtualization. 
Um, and so we all got like VMware trained and VMware certified. Um, and then, uh, you know, now it's time for the, I think uh, the next evolution, which is by containers and infrastructure as code. Um, again, I, um, as this that means, I think we've, we're always, I mean, we've been used to uh, scripting and automating in the past. I think, I personally think things, uh, got a little bit easier because um like with tools like ansible i had friends uh who, who've been working as sysadmins come to me and ask like do you have to learn coding to uh you know automate you know to to work with ansible and i'm like you, you didn't you don't really like yeah because i hate i mean they, they told me that they hate coding and having to learn i mean that's something they've been trying to run away since like college days and that's why they they wanted to move to the uh, the off side of things and you know we've been uh uh peaceful for for some time but now you know you, there's like code <laughs> here like too so peaceful for sometimes yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so i mean i told them uh you could just i mean it's not code it's it's yaml files and you know you could just now you could just write a yaml file and say provision 10 servers uh, with these specific uh images and uh, these specifics uh on these specific regions and then you know, just just run it, and then it's it's provision. And they were like, yeah, like in 15 minutes, they were like, yeah, I did, I automated provisioning of 10 servers. I didn't know this was so easy. So, um, so I think uh, the evolution there would be for uh, you know sysadmins who, who are not really good, uh, you know, who don't really want to code. Uh, I think it's an easier uh, evolution for them to uh, move to these tools and um, still. Ha still can automate but don't really have to code that much and i think those like uh uh crazy sysadmins who have like crazy bass uh, skills and you know shell uh, shell scripting skills or python skills they would evolve into uh you know customizing ansible you know writing custom ansible modules or you know custom filters uh, you know that's that's their kind of evolution so um and then, of course, uh, I mean, if you're from the VMware background and, you know, you're definitely, you have the VMware knowledge, but then now learning Kubernetes, then now you could be Tanzu uh, yeah. engineer, right? You know, so now you, the so the knowledge you had, the experience you had with VMware is still not going away because, you know, now you just have to add on Kubernetes knowledge and, and be Tanzu engineer. So, yeah, I think there's, uh, so the uh, you have to keep evolving, you have to keep learning. There's, I think... Uh, uh, especially in today's world, when where uh, things are changing so fast, I think there is no uh, no doubt about that. And but I, I believe it has never, it has always been like that. I know we've always yeah. maybe sped up a bit. That's a bit faster. Yep. Yeah. So here's the bit. billion dollar question. Okay, and this is from Michael Cade. I didn't have the brains to think it up. So where do you think things are going cloud native in the next 12 months? And what is the big barrier for adoption? And just to explain that some people might not understand, in North America, at least some people are saying, well, Kubernetes, there's not enough people who know it, it's too complicated. And then you have developers saying, yeah, but we love it, so it's coming. So where where do you think st things stand now? Where are they gonna come be in the next 12 months? And what would you see as the big barrier apart from lack of knowledge? Right? Yeah. Um, so I think the starting with the big barrier, um, at least in the in the past, um, like right before I quit my job, I had an opportunity to work with a few as as a consultant with a few uh, um, few companies, um, you know, large enterprises, and they had this goal of like completely um, uh, modernizing their entire infrastructure applications and. And one of the things that I try, I saw them try to do is uh, like take these age-old, like large uh, applications, you know, like WebSphere, those those built in WebSphere and stuff like that, and and try and containerize them, right? So so now you have like like two G two gigabytes of uh, containers running these old applications, and um, so um, so I don't think uh, I don't think that's the right approach. I think <clears throat> there's a the there's a workload that's uh, meant for the uh, cloud native world and, and containers of course like new applications and uh is, is definitely going to be 
uh, going this route. And as I said, it need not even be containers, right? It, it I think you always start as the most uh, uh, abstracted layer at the top, which is um, like uh, uh, lambda. I mean, uh, you know, lambda functions, or you know, just uh, um, uh, high, high, the high-level serverless where you're not even worried about. Uh, containers like you had Heroku in the past. Like Heroku has been there for like 10, 15 years. I remember uh, being able to just write a PHP application, uh, like a Facebook custom Facebook app that we had in the past, and then just push it to Heroku and not worry about anything, right? So it was just code. Then it just pushed to Heroku, and it, it just there, there were no containers even in the middle, right? Uh, I mean, at least that I was not aware of uh, at that time. So. Um, and then, and then we had containers and Kubernetes come to kind of bridge that the gap in in between. So, um, and as we have seen, right? Um, so it's always going to. I mean, the, uh, the the adoption is definitely going to increase. If you see the uh, the reports from Linux Foundation and the 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 CNCF uh, that that just came out like a few months ago, right? Um, a lot of organizations are moving this direction. Um, so I'm, I'm really not sure like in the t next 12 months, um, what's the uh, the big change that's going to happen. I mean, <clears throat> especially in the large enterprises, it's it's still, there's still like a lot of um, age old applications that's, that's going to continue to stay in that old way. But I think, you know, you, you look at the, uh, um, the, the different arts of migration migration to the cloud, right? Like the rehosting and refactoring. So I I think depending on what's best for those applications and how long they have to stay, and um, uh, I think it would depend a lot on those. Mm -hmm. um, and and when it comes to barrier of entry, I think it's uh, uh, it, it's got to do a lot with education and uh, not just you know. When we said DevOps, not just the developers or operations, but more uh, everyone else, uh, even the management um, teams at different organizations. But I, you know, right? If you look at it right now, everybody is. Uh, I think we're past that stage where you know, we're still trying to convince uh, people of upper, upper management. Um, uh, I think everybody is on the boat right now, and uh, you can see even like large enterprises is. Um, and making that move um, to 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 the cloud native and the, the DevOps world. So, okay, there's one more question from someone else here. Which uh, uh, let's see, find it. Uh, actually, Matt, I can't see it. Do you see the question? Maybe you can ask it for me. I'm trying to find it. It's in there. Someone said there was one more question. Yes, <clears throat> there is one more question from Michael as well. Michael oh. Cade. Um, you cannot see the chat. Um, no, I can't. It's just like my screen's over here, and I had I had my questions there. And I was trying to read. I'm on oh, a Mac. Okay. I'm learning curve. I used um, to be on Windows. They put me on a Mac. It's like, oh no. It's, so okay. Um, oh, I'm yeah, logging so, all the questions. He says, right? I see that one. Yeah. Uh, but another one for me is that Kubernetes is always deemed to be the developer focused. I am speaking more to uh, operation teams and now responsible for their Kubernetes clusters, just like they were before for vSphere clusters. Is this something that you are seeing? Uh, to have uh, to stop calling Kubernetes a developer-focused platform. So in other words, you know, these as well as you said, Tanzu, for instance, these vSphere administrators are now in charge of Tanzu, and people yeah. think Kubernetes is a developer platform. Are you now seeing that being now redefined as everyone's platform? I guess. Yeah. 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 So, um, so I, first of all, I think the, I mean, the reason that it is deemed as a developer-focused platform because is because I think it came from the developer community, right? Like Docker came from uh, developers trying to uh, make their life better, right? And I think, so that's how containers, uh, you know, came together. And then you had like container orchestration tools like Kubernetes and others, um, which, uh, yes, I mean, ideally it is to make the developer's life easy, but but as, as you can see, as, as you mentioned, um, now, with Tanzu and um, you know operations folks being responsible for you know maintaining the Kubernetes clusters and you know with, um, 
uh, responsible for their backup operations like uh, uh, with Weem and other other tools. Um, and there's there's the I, I did a little bit of work with Portworks where you know we had a course for them and there's a lot of things like the the storage integrations and all of that right so of course all of that is ops right so yeah I mean I I um, I think it's it it originated as a platform for making um, developers lives easier. Um, uh, was built by developers, but I, uh, right now, as, as I think, as you mentioned, it is it is for everyone. Yeah, and and I'll I'll add in one thing I think which is true. When someone said, well, "Why are you so interested in this?" I said, "Because you know, at the end of the day, it's fun. Kubernetes is fun. You can do things. If you went into IT originally, you went in there. Well, at least I did because it was fun. I was playing a game, and then I started to work. People paid me money for it, and Kubernetes brought back that feeling of." Wow, it was a feeling I had when I got into VMs at first from physical servers that you can do this all on this. And now with your laptop, you know, you can just create your own little world. So that's what I, I like to say to people is it's fun. Code Cloud's got fun courses too. So you can take something that looks terrifying and scary and have fun. So I think that's the way. Um, but uh, yeah, so folks, anybody, any more questions? We're just at the hour now. This was a fantastic talk. That's a problem. The really good talks go by so quickly. You go, oh no, I don't want to end them. But if there's anybody else out there wants a question, um, otherwise, you, know, you can always sign up for Code Cloud courses and ask a question. Um, but Madalena, yeah. I think that's, that's it. Look, I want to thank uh, Mumsha. That's a fantastic talk. Um, I've learned a lot. I think everyone else has. And um, anything you want to say, final mentions or something? Oh, no. So first of all, thanks um, for having me here. Uh, I think this was a really good conversation. And um, yeah. and, and the our slack channel is always open so if you just go to our uh, code, uh, our website and codecloud.com there's a link to join our slack channel so uh, you know it's open and anybody can join you get an invite and then you can uh, be part of our slack group so there's there's a lot of conversations happening there a lot of students trying to help each other so if you are someone who's uh who's finding it hard to uh you know uh, start or continue your learning you know, uh, drop by and uh, we have a lot of people uh, learning together. So yeah, thanks thanks for having me, Jeff. And... Thank you very much for being here, Mumshad, with us. Thank you, Jeff, for organizing this. And uh, this session is going to be recorded and we're gonna send it out. Uh, we're gonna post it on the YouTube, right, uh, Jeff? So mm -hmm. everyone will have access to it. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, we'll see you in the new year. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Bye, Bye you. Bye. New year and good.